You are listening to a podcast from Essendon Presbyterian Church in Melbourne, recorded 10 a.m. on July 28, 2024, presented by Rev. Chris Duke. Well, let's uh, turn to uh, Daniel. We've got a long reading this morning, but um, so bear, bear with us uh, and follow this reading because it's, uh, in, it's an important reading. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. And rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame a face to our kings, our princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a greater disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, All this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and made yourself a name, as it is this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant, and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. 
Now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, and therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider this wonderful prayer of Daniel, we pray, Lord, that you would refresh our hearts and our souls as we come to Consider certain aspects of it and bless each one of us as, as we hear these words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A question that we might ask is why is it difficult for Christians to pray? Can you remember when you were a child and you began to pray? Or maybe, or as parents, when you first taught your children to pray, did your prayers and your children's prayers often turn out to be a, a Christmas or a birthday wish list? Obviously, you don't want to dampen your child's faith, but there's merit in teaching a biblical view of prayer. However, we don't have to be children to get a misunderstanding of prayer. Too many people of all ages tend to view God as some sort of cosmic vending machine that dispenses blessings on the touch of a button. Even Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, how should we pray? Now Daniel is certainly one of the Old Testament inspirational characters. We know that he considered prayer to be vitally important. Three times a day, Daniel would retreat from his daily chores for prayer. Such a behaviour ultimately had him thrown into a den of lions. And as we examine Daniel's life, we can learn how to live as believers in, in God in a world that is hostile to the things of God. In Daniel 9 we find one of the longest prayers in the Bible. Daniel's prayer took place in the first year of Darius, of the Medes and of the Persians when he was made king over the Babylonians. When Daniel prayed in chapter 9, he was also reading Old Testament scriptures. Specifically, he was reading the book of Jeremiah. In Daniel's time, the writings of Jeremiah were not that old. They were recent writings, written when Daniel was a boy. There's no doubt that Daniel knew these writings well. And this wouldn't have been the first time that he meditated on the passages in Jeremiah. How long would they wait before they could return to Judah? And Jeremiah had prophesied that Jerusalem would lay desolate for a period of of 70 years. And the 70 years was almost completed and Daniel meditated on this unfulfilled prophecy. Of course, Daniel was a prophet 
whom God revealed revelations. Yet Daniel is studying scripture. Daniel desired that his heart and his mind be informed by scripture to be conformed to God and to be conformed to his word. We can all learn from this. Now Daniel was also, as it turned out, he became a great politician, a prime minister to one of the greatest monarchs on earth. And yet the desire of his heart was to converse with the word of God. The greatest and best men and women in the world must not think of themselves above their Bibles. We live in a hectic world full of busyness. But do we have time for God? And do we have time for his word? Do we have time for prayer? None of us are doing work more important than Daniel. Yet Daniel had time for God, for the scriptures, and also for prayer. As Daniel is reading Jeremiah, he contemplates that the 70 years is almost completed. We're going to return to our homeland soon. Let's throw a party. But Daniel's reaction is to pray. Even though he knew that God would keep his promise, Daniel goes to prayer and Daniel recognises the sovereignty of God and remembers the responsibility of man. In the first three verses of Daniel 9, we learn something about the context and the content of true Christian prayer. We learn that true prayer is grounded in the word of God. Now God had promised a specific end to the captivity and Daniel felt his continued responsibility to pray and especially now that God would do what he promised to do. Now of course this won't make any sense to any of us unless we believe in the sovereignty of God. That is that God is our king and ruler. that he's the ruler of, over all of creation. What, is the Bible, what the Bible says about God's sovereignty and man's responsibility go together here. So if God says he's going to do something, like end the cap- captivity, why bother praying about it? Well, the answer is because God desires us to, to respond to the promises of his word. The prayer of Daniel is a perfect model for praying. It's perfect because it begins and continues in a spirit of worship. Daniel makes no attempt to blame others for the misery that they're in. In verse 4 it says, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, he begins his prayer in adoration to God. Daniel isn't motivated here with false flattery, but with a genuine love and trust in God. And Daniel doesn't begin with petitions for what he wants. He doesn't come out and say, please take me home, dear God. Please take me back to Jerusalem. Please get me out of here quick. Daniel trusted in God's word and he believed and remembered God's promise to Abraham, despite the fact that this remnant of Abraham was held in captivity in Babylonia, Daniel still trusted in God to keep his promises because our God is a covenant-keeping God. We all need to be reminded of God's promises. God doesn't break his word like we do so often. If God says he'll do something, then he will. We all need to remember and believe this continually and be reminded of it daily. So what is a summary of Daniel's prayer? That God's will be done. That God's will be done. Lord, do as you said you would and establish your kingdom just like you said in your word. Now because he prayed that prayer, His prayer becomes an instrument of God in his activity on earth. 
The great Charles Spurgeon compared prayer to that of a homing pigeon. Prayer begins in the heart of God. It's sent out and it lands in the heart of God's people who then send it back to the heart of God. This is how Christian prayer works. God moves his people to pray by his word in accordance with his word with the content of God's promises found in his word. God's people understand this in their hearts and then they lift that prayer back to God. It comes to them from God and they send it back to God just like the homing pigeon is released and it finds its home again. God's promises should excite us, friends, to pray. God wants us to have a heart aligned with his will. We just don't wait and see what's going to unfold, but rather learn God's will through the study of his word and in prayer. This is how we capture the heart of our Lord God. So Daniel, Daniel was a fervent prayer. And he's a great example to us. This is what got him into trouble back in chapter 6. Of course, in that chapter we read about how he was thrown into a lion's den because he would only worship the one and the true living God. Now chronologically, chapter 9 occurs before chapter 6. Daniel has already met God's messenger, the angel Gabriel, there wasn't anyone who was going to stop Daniel from faithfully praying to his God, not lions, nor kings, nor their decrees. When Daniel prays fervently his prayer, his prayer isn't an afterthought when you climb into bed at night, friends. Is that when you pray? Daniel is known for setting, for the setting of three periods of time for prayer each day. He'd pray morning, midday, and then in the evening. However, on this particular occasion, Daniel has increased his fervour. There's renewed enthusiasm. There's renewed passion as he humbles himself before his God. There's fasting and there's sackcloth and he's covered in ashes. And wearing sackcloth and ashes is usually used during times of mourning and sorrow, especially following the death of a loved one. It's clear that Daniel is passionate and he's fervent and he's motivated as he remembers God's promise to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and Judah. And Daniel's prayer isn't self-centred. He's not praying for himself or for his own, de uh, his own needs, but he's praying for the needs of his people. And then Daniel, in his prayer as it unfolds, he's sorrowful for Israel's past sin, which he includes himself in. Daniel is, is sorry for the sin of his people and he demonstrates that with sackcloth and ashes. Friends, when one of God's people suffers, dear friends, we all suffer. If we truly love God and each other, the suffering of one member is also shared amongst us in all of our suffering. When Christ died for you, he took on himself the penalty of your sin and demonstrated the ultimate example of his love for his people, when we refer to the promises of God, we often think along the lines of receiving these individually. When we receive God's gift of salvation, it's given individually. And the eternal promises are given to us as individual believers. But when we're saved, we become part of the body of Christ, his church. The body changes our sense from the individual to the corporate. Now the world today promotes individuality but the Christian faith promotes corporate consideration. A Christian is not an island unto himself. As members of Christ's church on earth, 
we have responsibilities not only to our Lord, but also to each other. We all need Christ and we all need each other. When one of us is hurting, we all hurt. When one of us is full of joy, then we're all filled with joy. We all feel the joy. If we're not, there's something wrong with us. When one of us sins, then we all feel the consequence, even if we're not the offender. If one of us is immature in the faith because of sin, then we all have a corporate responsibility to encourage and pray for the growth in faith and understanding so that we can all grow together into maturity. This should shape how we do ministry. What attitude do we have for the ministries of the, of the church and this church? Do we pass the buck or are we truly interested? We need to pray for each other as we all engage in ministry. Our prayers and our relationship with God isn't just about you individually. It's about us and it concerns each other. Notice in Daniel verse, uh, notice in verse 4, Daniel humbly confesses the covenant that God has with Israel is to be feared and trusted. And then in verse 5 to 6, he gives a, a sorrowful confession of his people's responsibility in God's judgment. In other words, he confesses that Israel deserved judgment. They deserved the exile that God had given given them. Daniel just doesn't confess the sins of those in Israel's past, but he includes himself. Daniel has a corporate identity with Israel's past. In verse 5, it says, We have sinned, we have done wickedly and rebelled. We have departed from your precepts and your judgments. In verse 6, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. In verse 8, to us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you. And verse 10, we have not obeyed the voice of our Lord, our God, to walk in his laws. And then verse 11, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. When Daniel gets down to prayer, he immediately confesses to the Lord. The reason we're here in exile is entirely our own fault. Judgment has come as a result of our sin. We're not here because God isn't good. We're not here because our God isn't loving. We're here because we've, we've sinned and we've rebelled against God. And Daniel doesn't excuse himself from this judgment, but rather acknowledges that God is righteous in punishing Israel. Now, this is a fact that people have difficulty with today. How can a God, how can God send someone to hell if he's a loving God? God's righteousness comes because he is just. He executes his justice. Mankind deserves punishment for sin. God doesn't have to save anyone. But because God is merciful, he's provided a way of escape for the elect. When Jesus died on the cross, he completed our redemption by paying the penalty for our sin with his death. God is just, but he's also merciful. And God will show his mercy by keeping his promise to restore Judah and allow a remnant to return and rebuild Jerusalem. God is faithful to keep his covenant and Daniel believes that he will do so. Notice also in verse 7 to 8 that Daniel acknowledges God's righteousness in punishing Israel. It's not only that he says to the Lord, we're here because of our sins, he goes on to say, Lord, you were righteous to send us here. You were right, Lord, to punish us. Just imagine this. This would be wonderful if it happened often. I doubt that it does. It's like a child going back to a parent who's just been punished and saying, Mummy and Daddy, you were right to punish me because I sinned. 
wouldn't that be a nice uh, to hear from your children? You were right to do what you did. It's an acknowledgement of God's justice. And then in verses 9 to 15, Daniel makes an appeal to God's mercy based on his compassion, not based on Israel's deeds, not based on them being more deserving, but based on God's compassion. And then in verses 16 to 17, he lifts up a prayer in which he complains to the Lord about the desolate condition of his people. All this Daniel confesses before the Lord. In verses 16 to 19, he begins then to petition. He begins to make supplications or requests to the Lord. He petitions the Lord to restore the kingdom of Israel, that he would build up the spiritual condition of Israel. He offers arguments for why God should honour his promises. Primarily, he calls on God to respond to his prayer because of the honour of his name. The honour of his name because of God's city in Jerusalem and because of God's people. He seeks those things in God which actually belong to God. And again, we learn a lot of things from the way he prays. First of all, we learn the true prayer is based on what God has promised that he will do. You go to the word and discover what God has promised in the word and then you go back to God and say, Lord, please do what you've already promised, just like a child does to a parent. Parents, if you make a promise to a child, guess who reminds you when your memory becomes a little hazy? Do what you promised. That's exactly what God wants his children to do in prayer. I promised you this. Now bring that to me and say, Lord, do what you promised. This is exactly what Daniel does in his prayer. Notice how God-centred this prayer is. This prayer from beginning to end seeks God's glory. He doesn't say, Lord, do what you promised because we're such deserving people. We're such a wonderful people. He says, Lord, do what you promised because of your name and because of your reputation, because that's your city, Jerusalem, which is desolate, and because we are your people. We belong to you, Lord. Please answer these prayers, not for our sake, but for your sake, for your name, for your reputation, and for your honour and glory. And this prayer appeals to God's covenant mercy over and over and over again. And Daniel reminds himself in this prayer in verses 8, 11, 12 and 18 how God's covenant mercy had been shown towards Israel. And Daniel's prayer doesn't try and escape the issue of sin and misery. It doesn't try to escape responsibility. It faces the responsibility of sin and the result of misery full on. And Daniel acknowledges that God's people deserve to be punished. It doesn't bypass sin and misery. It expresses the plight of God's people to the Lord and asks him to forgive them. All those things we learn from Daniel's prayer of confession. And then in verses 20 to 23, we learn something quite unique and glorious. In these verses, we learn that Daniel's prayer is heard. And we have a description given to us of what happened in heaven when Daniel prayed. And we need to treat these few verses preciously because we don't have many examples of this. There are some examples of what happens in heaven in the book of Revelation when Christians pray. So treat these verses very carefully and treat them as precious because these verses teach us that God always hears true prayer. In verses 20 to 21, you can see the reality of God hearing our prayers. Here we're told that when Daniel prayed, God sent Gabriel. Look at these verses. What is God telling us here? God is telling us that he always immediately hears our prayers, even if God's answer is delayed. 
He hears our prayers immediately. His heart is immediately with his people. And in this case, he sent an angel to interrupt Daniel in the middle of his prayer to assure him that his prayer had been heard. In verse 23, Gabriel gives Daniel a benediction, a blessing that comes from God himself. He says that Daniel is a man greatly beloved. Daniel is a man that is greatly beloved. Can you imagine a greeting from heaven that informs you that you're dearly beloved of God? Well, we're told that in Scripture, friends. You might not hear it from an angel, but we're told it from Scripture. And yet every time we pray, based on the merits of of Christ in Christ's name, we should realise that God hasn't just simply sent an angel to us. Rather, he sent his own dear son to assure us of his love and who died on our behalf. Not an angel, but his son. Every time we say in Jesus' name, we should be mindful of this. I want to know two things that we learn in verse 21. Daniel says, Gabriel came to him about the time of evening offering. Daniel doesn't draw attention to this, but says it in passing. This is one of the most moving phrases in this passage because it reminds us, because it's been decades, friends, since Daniel had been in Jerusalem at the time of the evening offering. Yet his heart was still being set by the worship of God morning and evening in the sacrifices of the temple. It's an almost incidental statement, but Daniel hasn't forgotten. When God answers Daniel's prayer, God gives Daniel more than he asked. God's people will return to Judah, but there's more. God responded to Daniel's prayer by saying, Daniel, there's something much bigger here. And it was in response to this prayer of Daniel that God set in motion the prophecies leading to the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Daniel prayed for the end of exile, but God is saying more. Daniel, in part of your... In part, your prayers are being answered, but I want to tell you more. I want to tell you of the coming of Messiah, the Prince. God always answers our prayers far beyond our fondest hopes because his mercy is beyond our expectations, friends. So what does that mean for us today? When you pray, do you believe God? Do you trust God? Do you believe in his promises? Do you pray according to his will and his word? Do you seek the heart of God to know how to pray? Now, friends, let me assure you, You don't have to be ultra-spiritual to pray. And you don't always have to know all of God's word. However, with the knowledge you do have, you should pray. We all should pray. And I just want to re-emphasise our prayer meetings, friends. Our prayer meetings are the hub of our fellowship, along with our, our, our Lord's Day worship. Pray to your Father in heaven. Ask him for a changed heart that seeks to know and to do God's will in your life, in the life of us collectively as his church here in this place. And, of course, in his church all over. Pray for yourself, yes. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your family. Pray for our fellowship here at Essendon and beyond for our missionaries. They need our constant prayer. Pray for Christians all over the world, for the persecuted church. Pray that 
the Lord's will will be done, that his kingdom will come. You see, Jesus is returning again. He's going to come. And how is he going to find us? Is he going to find us asleep or is he going to find us as a praying church, a faithful church, a church that is seeking his will? I pray that that he'll find us in that capacity. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for Daniel. Thank you for this reminder of his great faith in your promises and his knowledge of your word. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would enable us to have a greater desire to know your word and to pray your will to be done in our lives and in the lives of our church and the lives of your universal church. And Lord, we pray that you would draw many people to yourself through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. More messages of hope at Essendon Presbyterian Church.org.au or wherever you get your podcasts from.